Chapter 12, okay, so it says, Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the, and depending on your translation, if it's an older one, it's going to say Ethiopian woman, for he had married, an, because of the Ethiopian woman who he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Modern translations will say Cushite woman, same thing, okay? Uh, but right after it says what they said, it says that they said, has the Lord indeed only spoken through Moses? All right. Now, it sounds like they're not talking about her. Did they mention her at all? No, they didn't mention her. Has the Lord only spoken through Moses? Has he not also spoken through us? And here is the phrase that you need to notate for yourself for future purposes, where it says, the Lord heard them. All right. And it says that Moses was very, the man Moses was very humble. As a matter of fact, he is more humble than any man on the face of the earth. Okay, we're going to stop right there. Okay, so it's interesting. The statement that they said did not mention the wife. Did y'all catch that? They were talking about prophecy. They were talking about the Lord speaking through them. They were talking about well, you know, it looks like, you know, God uses us just like Moses. So why does the passage start out first talking about they spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married? Why? Because that was what is really behind it. All right, the majority of modern American commentaries actually say the reverse of what it says in the text. The text, what does the text say? It tells us. What is the cause for why they made the statement about God speaking through Moses and them? It says they were speaking against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman who he had married. That is not the route that most American commentaries take. The route that most American commentaries take is this that they really didn't kind of have so much of a problem with his wife as much as they were having a problem with Moses and they were looking for something to have a wedge because for whatever reason, and they act like it's a mystery a little bit in the commentaries, for whatever reason they were grumbling against Moses and they had a form of jealousy about probably his high position among the people. I ask you, is that what the text says? Matter of fact, we'll stop right here. It says it twice, does it not? It says, because of the Ethiopian woman he had married, one. For he had married an Ethiopian woman, two. It says it twice. They were jealous of Moses, and they were questioning of Moses' authority, and they were thinking that maybe they can function just as well as Moses. But what's the spark, the cause, for why they start having this attitude towards Moses? Well, let's take a look at the situation. Miriam and Aaron had spent their entire life in slavery in Egypt. And for those of you who don't know, in a situation like that, they're in the ghetto of Goshen, and everything around them is utter hostility being murdered by the Egyptians, being murdered by everybody in power, being put to slavery, being raped by them, all the kinds of things that go along with an intense, severe oppression, okay? When you are under those types of situations, you fortify yourself within your people, within your group. We all do this, right? Who do you turn to in times of trouble? You turn to your family. You turn to those closest to you, right? And in situations where you have an entire nation in slavery, is it possible that they become very turned in their mindset to trust who and who only? Your own. That's it. But you want to know who did not live a life like this? Moses didn't grow up in the slavery. Okay? He grew up within the royal chambers. And then once he became kind of awakened to the scenario that was going on to his own people, he reacts rashly and he kills the Egyptian, buries him within the sand, and he goes off. And he goes off into Midian. And he marries a Midianite woman. Midianite woman is not a Hebrew. 
Okay? So while he's out there, he leaves and he goes to different cultures. Now, in Josephus' uh, histories of the Jews, Joseph, we do, this is not in the Bible. We do not know that this is true. But this is at least interesting about the traditions that they held about Moses. Before Moses became someone who suddenly awakened to do something about the, Jewish, the Hebrew slavery, he was a general for Egypt, and he waged war on different countries. And one of the countries that he was at war with was Ethiopia. But he was also a great leader in the minds of everyone, and that he was able to try to settle things peacefully sometimes. And one of the ways that he settled one of these issues was he married the princess from Ethiopia. And that that brought about a peace between Egypt and Ethiopia. And he came back a hero to Egypt. We don't know that that's true. But the image here is of a guy who is cultured, traveled. He has seen many different cultures. He goes to Midia. He marries a non-Hebrew woman. Now at this time, it is probably, and I won't go into this why, is probably that that first wife, the Midianite daughter of Jethro, is probably passed away at this point because it sounds like this is talking about a fresh situation, right? And so what happens, it sounds like this is his second wife, okay? Now, they have just become free, okay? Moses did not live among them all those years in slavery, okay? I don't care what, it's, I don't care what Cecil B. DeMille showed you in the Ten Commandments, Moses basically went from royalty to a fugitive, okay? He didn't get down there in the mud pits. So what happens is they know that Moses is the deliverer, but Moses never went through the things that they did. Matter of fact, while he was out there in Midia, he married a non-Hebrew woman. Now this presses deeper into the mind of Hebrews than you think. Because when you look back at Abraham, when it was time for uh, Isaac to get a wife, what did he do? Isaac, his heart was broken over the loss of his mother, Sarah. And he was determined, my boy isn't going to marry any of these Canaanites. I wanted him to be sent back to my people. And he goes there and he gets a wife from one of his own, from Abraham's family. Okay, comes back and Rebecca is presented to him and they fall in love, right? This is the type of mindset and it was actually very interesting that Abraham that had that mindset, okay? And then it's a very big stink within Abraham's life that he had a son by an Egyptian woman, okay? She was actually put out, Hagar. She was not the woman of promise. She's the bondservant woman who's re recalled back again in Romans by Paul. Then on top of it, we see the lineage go further down. And what woman does Esau marry? And it greatly discouraged his family. An Egyptian woman. Like any culture that pops up, people think that you should stick with your own. Okay, maybe they have good reasons. Maybe this is a pagan, but maybe that's not really it. Maybe that's a smokescreen. So on top of this, Zippor probably has died, and Moses doesn't take a Hebrew woman as his wife. He takes an Ethiopian woman, another second wife who's not Hebrew. We all know how people think about stuff like this. Human nature. And it seems like it's instigated by Miriam. And Miriam might be expressing the views that may be going around because before this we have three other instances of discussions in earlier in numbers leading right up to this where people were upset at Moses. And they were coming up with, they were upset they didn't have meat. They didn't, upset they didn't have water. They were constantly getting upset, upset. And his authority was constantly being questioned. And it looks like it finally goes all the way to the top, questioning him even by his own family. You know what? He did it again. 
He is the leader of the Hebrew nation. He's supposed to be our deliverer. And we already know that there's all this language going around that like Israel is like God's bride. Marriage is a big deal. And he is the very symbol of all of Hebrew. He's the Hebrew of Hebrews. Yeah, he marries an Ethiopian. Marries an Ethiopian. Two marriages, not Hebrew. Marries someone from another nation. Marries a Gentile. That's what he did. He marries a Gentile. That's really what is going on here. And when you're dealing with an Ethiopian, let's put it this way. Maybe if you're dealing with a Midianite, and uh, maybe people go, maybe it takes a while for them to figure out that's a Gentile. But does it take very long to just look at an Ethiopian woman to figure her out? I don't think Moses married a Hebrew. Even Jeremiah brings this up. God in prophecy, speaking to Jeremiah, brings up the unique color of Ethiopians. He brings up in such a way because people are knowledgeable of it. Have you seen an Ethiopian? They're pretty dark, pretty unique, unique individuals. And so what happens is, even in Jeremiah, I believe it's Jeremiah 13, it says, can the Ethiopian change his what? Color. That's a standout. God even uses the uniqueness of the color of the Ethiopians to make a point about some things by nature are hard to change. And he follows it up with, can the leopard change his own spots? There are certain things by nature only who can change. Only God can change that which man cannot change. So even as an analogy being used by God in prophecy to Jeremiah, God even brings up to the Hebrews because he wants to talk to them about something that would be very vivid in their mind. And so he brings up the fact that color is very unique among the Ethiopians. That is in the mindset. And when you see an Ethiopian, real quick you go, that's not a Hebrew. Moses did not marry a Hebrew. And they got a problem with that. And that is behind, because they never mention her there. And that's what's behind it whenever it says, well, is God indeed only spoken through Moses? There's something about that statement. Has he not spoken through us as well? It's almost like this. And I can tell you how it is as a pastor. When people start to try to take you down, not by targeting you, they try to target your family. That's happened to me before. I remember a treasurer at a church I used to be at in a business meeting just happened to bring up Gabriel. And Gabriel at the time, I believe, was two. Gabriel was like two. And she said, you know what? If my son acted like your son, I would beat him. That's intended to get a man who is in charge to lose his cool, isn't it? Because is it really about Gabriel in a business meeting? Are we having a business meeting about Gabriel? No. We're having a business meeting about me. And they're using him to get to me. All right? So what happens here is that there's these dynamics. And they go, I don't like what I see here. Is he really qualified to lead Hebrews? Does he love Hebrews? He marries a Gentile on top of all this stuff. Well, it goes ahead and it says, God heard them. Okay? He's going to show them very vividly that they are nothing like Moses. But the cause of it was because of his wife. It says so twice. Now, let's go ahead with this where it says, uh, and he was humble. Now, that right there probably means this, because in the Hebrew, humble doesn't cover, cover what it really says in Hebrew. We have a difficult time getting what the Hebrew word there actually says. It's something more like a mix between the concept of humble and the concept of being extremely poor. Kind of weird, but it kind of fits with the Beatitudes, doesn't it? Blessed is the poor in spirit. So there's this weird phrase in Hebrew that we just translate humble. But it's a mix between humble and poor, which most likely means something like 
almost fragile, easy to take advantage of, like the poor. Almost like they can't fight for themselves or they're unwilling to stick up for themselves or something like that because they feel like they're under the gun. So it points out that Moses isn't the type to try to take this into his own hands. He has an aversion to confrontation. Can you kind of see that there? And he knows that the heat's against him. His people are talking about meat. They're talking about water. And now his own family is talking about him not really being what he seems to be. But it says this, and it says, But suddenly God spoke to Moses and Aaron and to Miriam and said, Three of you come to the tent of meeting. All right? So it says that they came out and they came to the tent of meeting. It says that the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. That means it's daytime. (laughs) Because when it's daytime, he's a cloud. Comes down a pillar of a cloud and he stands in the doorway of the temple. Significant. This is what that means. Who is Aaron? Aaron is the high priest. Who is the one man who always has access into the tent of meeting? Aaron. That is his spot. That's like his office. That was where he does business. God comes down in the form of that cloud, which actually would have been back inside the Holy of Holies, inside that tabernacle. Probably going up from the Holy of Holies up to the sky that they could see. That that pillar of cloud moves forward to the door and doesn't let Aaron in. He stands blocking the door from Aaron and Miriam. You see the imagery there that's sending a message to Aaron. You only come in here by my graces. And he calls for those two to come forward and says that they both come forward and he says this and he says, now hear me. He said, if there is a prophet among you, I reveal myself, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them through a vision, okay? And I speak to them in a dream, but not so with Moses. With Moses, we speak mouth to mouth, okay? Uh, With Moses, uh, I speak openly, and I do not use dark language or dark mysteries. And uh, uh, with Moses, uh, I'm sorry, what is it? I lost my place. Oh, yeah. Not so with my servant Moses, who is faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth by mouth, even openly and not in dark sayings. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? All right. So he does not let them into the, the tent of meeting. He blocks them. He has just those two come forward. All right. He's saying, this is for you too. Now, here's the scary part about this situation. God right here is saying, with all the rest of you guys, how have I always spoken to you? I've spoken to you in the form of visions. I've spoken to you in the form of dreams. Now, at the moment that God is saying this to Miriam Miriam and Aaron, is he speaking to them in the form of a vision? No. Is he speaking to them in the form of a dream? What just happened never occurs to Miriam and Aaron. This is not how God ever speaks to them or any of them. What he did is he just scared the pants off of them. He shows up and lets them see and experience how God talks with Moses. Isn't he talking just like that to them? He's talking with them face to face. He's talking with them, not in a dream, not in a vision. He's saying, this is real. What you're experiencing right now is how I talk to Moses. I never talk to any of you like this. This is what it's like. The way I'm talking to you right now, this is the way me and Moses are. And he is faithful in all my household. That imagery there is just like Joseph being over all of Egypt. And that Pharaoh was the only one over him, but he just handed it all off to Joseph. And it's like, that is what Moses is to the house of the Lord. Basically, I let him run with it. He's the big boss man. 
Matter of fact, the way me and him communicate, the way I communicate with you guys is like mailing you a letter, sending you a text. But the way I communicate with Moses is I sit down and have breakfast and coffees at some restaurant and greasy spoon with him and we hash things out. That's the way it is between me and him. And you're going to question him. Why? Because you want to make some kind of religious statement to cover up your prejudice. That's what it really is. You have some kind of deep prejudice. And in that prejudice, instead of willing to say, Moses must know what's right. It must be good for Moses to marry an Ethiopian. Because God and Moses probably have had a conversation about that marriage. Moses is always right, is what he's saying to them on these issues. And you want to know who has literally sat down the law about marriage for the Hebrews? There's a lot of laws about marriage and sexuality and whatnot in the Levitical law. And you want to know who those hands came down holding those tablets about all of it? Not Miriam, not Aaron. Moses. Moses might know a little bit about who he can and can't marry. He's different. He's unlike anyone in the entire Old Testament. And even now to this day, this is what I said to a woman a little while back. She said, she gave me scripture for why she doesn't believe that people can intermarry, interracial marry. That's not even a biblical concept. Race is some kind of demonic invention by Charles Darwin. She said, I don't believe in mixing of seed. Oh, so biblical sounding. All right? You're talking about mixing and sowing different seeds from plants, and you're comparing that to humans getting married. And you think that you're some kind of biblical scholar to try to hide what's really in your heart, that you're a hateful bigot. I said, oh, okay. So I guess Moses who was the one who actually was given the law about the mixing of seed, must have been wrong. She was completely unaware of this entire chapter. I said, you do know Moses married an Ethiopian woman. Uh, 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 uh. Moses, I guess he must have mixed seed. He must have been sinful. I said, you want to know what happened to the, pers- the main person who came against Moses because of that marriage to an Ethiopian woman? And it will go on here and it will say that she was stricken with leprosy. She was stricken with leprosy to the point that it was the most advanced form where it describes it as being snow white. The concept of color emerges once more in this passage. I don't know how. I do not know how scholars are not catching all of this reference here. Even Jeremiah mentions the skin color of the Ethiopian. And right here she's punished with being whiter than she's ever been in her life. Color is definitely a concept here, okay? But they want to avoid it, and they just go. All the scholars just talk about, oh, well, this is an advanced form of leprosy. Yeah, we know that, and it sure is interesting that the description of it is snow white, because even among a white Hebrew, the way we might describe them as white back there in the Middle East, there is no such thing as anybody who's lily white. She's made white as snow. And it horrifies them because God's cloud rescinds back. And that when it's gone, it says that the the anger of the Lord burned against them and that the cloud went back and then suddenly she was leprous and she was white as snow. Kind of an interesting play on imagery. Stuff like this, Zephaniah did this inside of all his book, doing a play on the concept of dark and light all the time to kind of make concepts to people. And so what happens is all of a sudden Aaron is horrified and he begs Moses, please don't let her be like this with like her skin as though someone who's dead and like a child who's been born with their flesh half gone. And so guess what? Why didn't Aaron pray for himself if God speaks to him as well as Moses? Why didn't she? Why didn't she beg the Lord to heal her? Why didn't Aaron beg the Lord to heal her? You know why? Because Moses is the man. And God just taught them a harsh lesson. Don't you dare try to touch Moses and use his own family. 
against him because of your own deep prejudice. Now, here's the interesting part here. And the reason that she's put out of the camp for seven days is because even God's response when Moses, Moses is nice, and goes to the Lord on her behalf, while she's been, he, it's been revealed, it's in the text, that they got a problem with his own wife. And so he pleads to the Lord on behalf of her. And the Lord's response is this. Hey, you know what? Even if her father spit in her face, which back then, if a father, that was actually a huge insult. If a daughter was to do something that was very dishonoring to the family, the father would spit in her face. And immediately it would become publicly known. Why? Because they have to usher her all the way out of the camp. She's unclean. And because she's... Unclean, not so much just because spit went in her face. She's unclean because what have she done to get the spit in her face? And then they would usher her out of the camp. She'd be out of there. And she couldn't come back, and she was ritualistically clean after seven days. And so God came into this situation like this. Moses, Aaron, and Miriam are like his kids. And in a way, that was God spitting in her face for her having a problem with Moses marrying an Ethiopian. Think about that. That was God saying, I essentially spit in Miriam's face for that. Now, I'll heal her, but she's going to be out of the camp. And don't, you got to understand Miriam's place, and I'll close with this. Miriam's place is that she was the head of the, what's called the spirit-filled prophetesses. That's mentioned, I think, in like Exodus 15 or something like that. She's a big deal. She really represents the community of prophets within the nation of Israel and represents the high priest of Israel. And the two of them collectively have come against Moses. And God sets this straight. And so she's out of the camp, and they don't move ever again until the seven days are done, and then they move on. Do you think the whole of all of Israel has a new fresh attitude about the Ethiopian woman? Hmm, I think we probably won't grumble about the Ethiopian woman anymore. That's what happened. That's a lesson, but there's a deeper thing here. And I want to appreciate John Calvin. I'm not a Calvinist, but out of all the commentaries I read, I, I noticed that there was something. They would emphasize only one part of everything. They'd emphasize just that they came against his authority. Came against his authority. Came against his authority. Came against his authority. All of this is what I read leading all the way back through American history, British history, all the commentators, until you get to a time frame before Western slavery, and all of a sudden the commentaries change, and they recognize the issue of her being a foreign woman, not of their nation. And John Calvin nailed it. John Calvin did catch it, and he says, their problem was that they did have a problem on two respects. They had a problem with his authority, but they had a problem with his authority because they had a problem with him marrying a Gentile. Now, even John Calvin didn't catch this that I've seen for a long time in this passage, and maybe because my experience as a man who's married to a beautiful Jamaican woman, that I've maybe looked at this more deeply. And I've only found one commentator in all of church history who nailed it. Back in A.D. 397, Ambrose of Milan, he's the guy who saw the same. And I was looking, I've seen this thing for years in this text. And I've never been able to find anyone else who saw it. But Ambrose of Milan in AD, 3, AD 397 said exactly what I thought, and I found it last night. He said, this is the foreshadow of the great mystery of Jesus Christ that Paul talked about in Ephesians. I was like, another guy saw it. Finally, after all these years, this way that I would interpret this, there was a dude who really did see it. An early church father did capture it. Paul talked about the great mystery of Jesus Christ that was not revealed to anyone. But God only reveals things sometimes in dark sayings that we cannot fully understand and we see through a glass darkly. And he said clearly, he said, Moses, the Hebrew of Hebrews, representing God in a way who marries and makes a choice of who to bring into Israel. He brought in to have as his own 
his most closest personal relative to share his life with a Gentile woman, not of the Hebrews. It is the mystery that Paul talks about that Jesus Christ was going to die for the sins of the Gentiles and make them his bride. This is a foreshadow of the gospel coming to those of us who are not Hebrews. Those of us who to the Jews looked very, very different. And that maybe they even grumbled because, you know, they did grumble when Paul took the gospel to the Gentiles. What are you doing? It caused an uproar. There was racial tension. That's why we developed the concept of deacons there in Acts. Because they're saying, well, you know, these are being overlooked. The Gentile widows are being overlooked. There was racial tension going on there all the time. But the concept, that mystery, was that God was going to choose through Christ those who were not his. In the place where it was says, you are not my people, from the prophet, they will be called my people. So when you see Moses, Mary, and this woman who's very different, he brings into Israel a whole new relationship. Just like Jesus goes and he makes his bride, not just the Gentiles, but it's significant that the Gentiles were brought in. And it always prophesied that there would be the great prophecy about Moses and Jesus, where it says, the Lord will send you a prophet like, and this is Moses talking. He gave a prophecy of the Messiah. He will send you a prophet like unto me. In a way, you could say the Gentile church is Jesus' Ethiopian bride. 